takeaway that I want to give you is like, no matter where you are today, don't think it's too late to change it. Never. All that, needs to ha- all that, all that needs to happen is you have to embrace where you are and question, become curious about whether or not this is what's working for you. And if it is, then go deeper into that questioning. Curiosity will save your life. All right, guys, welcome back to Flip Your Mindset. I am your host, Stacey Urig. My guest, of course, is Vincent Castellanos, the responsibility coach. If you listened to our first episode together, you're going to know this is hot, fiery, fun (laughs) energy, but we're talking about big, deep, tough topics. Um, Last time we talked about how to fuck Madison Avenue, what that meant. We started to open the door to this pervasive society of labeling, which we're going to talk about today. But as we kick it off, Vincent, what's going on and what happened yesterday? Oh, my God. So I have this really, I don't know, for me, it's really empowering and powerful story. So um, some of you may or may not know that I was a working actor with a career in Hollywood for years. I started acting at the age of five, doing puppet theater in Cuba at the age of 10. I started doing theater in Miami, started taking dance lessons, became a dancer and an actor, and did that for my whole life. Yesterday, I let go of my theatrical representation and Mm. came to that conclusion that I no longer have to pursue an acting career. Here's why that's important. Here's why that means something to this conversation. Because what happens is acting served its purpose, saved my life. It was a saving grace in my life. And without it, I don't think I'd be the man that I am here talking to you today. As a child, early on with puppet theater, it allowed me to navigate and survive my childhood story, my trauma, my abuse, all of those things. Later on, As a teenager, the same thing. I was able to have that outlet combined with drugs and alcohol. These two things allowed me to get through. Eventually, I got sober. And when I got sober, acting, the the impact that it's had on me, I believe, is the reason I'm still sober. I'm going to tell you why. I was nine months sober when I came from New York to L.A. to do my first big Hollywood movie. It was The Crow, City of Angels. I played a character, Spider Monkey. And that started a career of playing unsavory unsavory characters, really tortured souls. All parts of me that were alive in me. And as I got sober, I no longer had that drugs and alcohol medicine to keep me from having those feelings. I was able to then, in sobriety, start to get hired. So as I got sober, all of these feelings and all of these memories started to rise up. And because I was getting hired for the first 10 years as the bad guy, the unsavory guy, all of these things, I was able to have an outlet for these parts. I was able to survive my sobriety long enough, stay sober long enough to seek recovery to find out what happened to me, right? Mm. What happened to me as a child and start to navigate the world of recovery and healing for trauma. Fast forward to the man that I am today in recovery from drugs, from alcohol, from my trauma, in service to that community by being a drug and alcohol counselor, by being a trauma recovery coach, by being a life coach, by doing all of these things, being a service, passing on to others a way in which they can live the life they love to live and heal, not only from expertise and education and degrees, whatever that means, but from experience as well, I get to a point, too, where acting served its role. I no longer need to do that. And the way that it came about is that I just got an audition. I got this audition for this lead role in a new series, and I opened up the the submission, and it was like, it was like lightning. It was like, I no longer need to do that. It no longer fulfills the need anymore because I no longer have to hide behind characters to navigate, express, and process my emotions. My parts don't need that outlet anymore. I am integrated. All of my parts are in harmony, and I am self-led. And as a result of that, I no longer have to be an actor, which in a way, it's a label that I took on 
that in so many ways was my identity. Now, I'm very grateful for acting, and I'm very grateful for the fact that I was successful. I will live in celluloid for a lifetime. I got the wealth from it when I was working. I got the notoriety. I got all of my dreams, all of my wishes, all of that that I thought I needed. I got it. I got yes. it. And then I got this. And so what's it? why is this important? This is important because this is the result of engaging in process, right? And getting to authentic self, getting to authentic self. And we don't know, I didn't know, that all I was doing in the acting was surviving, finding a way, reaching out, yelling out for like, look at me, look at me. I need an outlet. I need an outlet. So when I started to recover and heal, first in sobriety and then in trauma recovery, I got there. I got there. So everything served its purpose. And this is the new life. That is, oh my God. First of all, thank you so much for sharing that story. That is so profound. And congratulations to you. Yeah, thank you. I mean, really, what a testament. And you would never understand all of what you just described had you not done your own work. And actually, as you were talking, I wrote down on my piece of paper, Heath Ledger. Mm, When Heath Ledger died, knowing nothing about trauma at the time, knowing nothing about parts work, I knew deeply in my soul that this guy got so entrenched in the part. Mm -hmm. Right? Because you were talking about a deep, dark part that was a very dark role. Yeah. He was in at the time. I just just remember it was really profound for me. It was a really dark role. And I thought to myself, he not using this language, but I would use it now. He was so blended with that part of him. Exactly. 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 He could not see any way out. Yeah. There's the training that I, and I've been training to be an actor since the age of 12. So, and I was a part of the actor studio and I studied Meissner and all of the above. I studied with Hanman. So I had like this really thorough training where I was taught in my training to get lost in the character, which is the reason why I was successful because I was able to bring that type of authenticity to my work. And so when you, in, in, in my case, having been a victim of trauma and abuse in my childhood and having all those parts be so decompartmentalized being an actor hired to do these roles having an outlet for that part was necessary however the danger in that is that sometimes when you're so really entrenched in that work in the role acting sometimes it takes a little bit of a it's a little bit difficult to break out of it and come back come out of that and that's when you talk about Heath Ledger that's that's, I think, without sobriety, had I had I experienced my acting success in film, I had success in the theater, but had I experienced my career as an actor in film prior to getting sober, I don't think I'd be here. I don't think I'd be alive because it was too close to the fire, yeah. too close to the fire. But because I was sober, I had that to fall into. And I had that support group and I had that, that camaraderie with me. I was able to then process it out and use it as a release rather than a detriment. You know, so when you talk to Heath Ledger, that's what comes up for me. Well, and I'm also now thinking of Britney Spears because I, I actually yeah. did her book on Audible. Yeah. And because I was just so curious because I knew there was so much adversity in her childhood. Yeah. and call it trauma, call it whatever you want to call it. It was fucked up and I knew it and I wanted to hear the story. I wanted to hear her version of it. And she talked about how she acted in a movie and got great accolades for it, but she lost herself in the character. Correct. And she was then later offered the notebook and she declined it because she had such a hard time coming out of character yeah. from the first movie she did. She right. didn't know enough about herself and didn't trust that she would get lost again yeah. in the character. 
And she said it was so scary to be that it really separated from self, even though that's not the language she used. The first time she was at least attuned enough to know I don't have the right system, support, community, whatever, to not get lost again. And so it's now. You know, true acting is really allowing a part to take over. Right. 100%. And sometimes the parts don't want to go back in. Now, the difference between theater and now we're doing a whole thing on acting, but it doesn't matter because it's so relevant. The difference between theater acting, doing a play, and film acting, doing a film or a TV series, is that when you do a play, there's two hour period where you have a beginning, a middle, and an end. So that part of you comes to life and it goes all the way through and goes away. Right. When you're doing two hours and then you decompress. Right. When you're doing film, you have to keep that part alive for you for days in chunks, like one scene here. Let's say the scene here is a confrontation and you're doing that scene. You're going to work on that scene for a couple of days. Then you're going to do some other scenes. Then you're going to do go back to another scene and you're going to do the scene where you actually kill the person. And you're going to do that scene for a couple of days. But then you got to go back to the scene where you have the confrontation because there's footage missing, right? So it's, it's this cacophony of back and forth emotion and expressions that can make you insane. And without the proper training, these parts stay alive longer than they need to be because they forget that they're doing a role. Now they think this is who we are, right? So without, that's why I said, without sobriety, had I engaged in this part of my life, I don't know that I would have made it. You know, I'm, I know we were going to intentionally talk about the labels and we're going to get to that episode at some point, either here or in another episode, but you're making me think, okay, so you went into that process and then got sober and then soared, but think about the people who come into that process and here's the deal. We all have had challenges growing up. We've all had adversity call it whatever you want. Many of us grew up in extreme dysfunction. Now you're doing this work where you're really playing a role, right? Which is really, really what a part is. Um, From your personal experience, from your intimate experience in Hollywood and in film and in movie, how many people then end up starting to drink, starting to numb out with a drug because now they're feeling so fragmented from self. Correct. All these fragmented parts, all these different quote unquote roles they've been hired to play and they don't know what to do with all that's coming up because they have all this unresolved shit that's now kind of playing out. Yeah. So I don't know the actual number of that, but it's really, really high because here's what happens when you're playing a role. You don't know that you're playing a role. Your part doesn't that doesn't the part doesn't know that you're acting. There's a part of you that knows that you're acting. But in the minute in the in it, you're just existing in that. So what happens is you need drug and alcohol to break out of it. Get out of it. The other thing that happens is sometimes the information that comes through, the enjoyment and the release that you get from killing people, from shooting people, from whatever it is that you're experiencing when you're playing bad guys, or the the, the feelings that you get from getting married, falling in love when you've never been able to do that in, in your own person. It's so extreme and so intense, right? That when you're out of it, those sensations, that information is alive in you. So suicide ideation comes into play. Suicide comes into play because you start to then compare yourself to that part and the part becomes real. And so you go down a very, very, very risky road. Now, this is for a very specific type of method acting. There's also a type of actor that is all technical. You go, you say your lines, you don't feel shit. You just technically, you go on. Yeah, I get it. That happens too. But when you're really, truly a method actor and you go in, it's an intense, intense, intense journey. And it's not for everyone. 
I'm thinking there's got to be a host of therapists and trauma coaches in LA that literally are just looking to work with method actors because there's got to be so much to unpack. The best part about being a working actor in film and TV is that the insurance is fucking fantastic. So you can afford therapy. (laughs) Oh my God. Yeah. It's a, it's a real, it's a real thing. So I said goodbye to that. Yeah. But congratulations on saying that this period of your life and anybody can really relate to this when you've done something, right. Whether it's acting like something in your profession, or it could be a relationship. Mm-hmm. It's okay to recognize, even if you dedicated decades, like we hear about this with relationships, right? Where like, how can I walk away from this? I've invested right. so much time, energy, money, tears, whatever, to this relationship, to this profession, to whatever. It can be very scary because like you said, who am I without? And I think for you to have done all the work you've done up to this point to say who I am is Vincent Castellanos. That's correct. And what I've done for money, for accolades, for blah, 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 is acted. And that was great for the time it served me, but it doesn't serve me any well. I need to serve it another way. And the gratitude and respect that it deserves. The gratitude and respect that it deserves because it served an incredible role in my life i will i mean this is you know this thanksgiving when i was doing gratitude i tapped into the fact that i'm grateful for everything that's happened to me my abuse my trauma my alcoholism my drug addiction my mother dying my father dying i am grateful for everything that's ever happened to me because that is what makes me who i am today and who i am today is fucking amazing Okay. Not from an egotistical perspective, from no. a very solid, grounded perspective. I, I got here. I got here. You got here. We got here. This is to be celebrated. And in celebration and acceptance and the ability to live self-led, there's only gratitude for what came before, which is a worship that I'm doing called Flipping the Narrative. But we're going to do that later. Uh, so this is... This is what it is. But you know, this is the result of the work. And by the way, it's not 100%. over. It's just a it's just a milestone on the journey of completely. There's so much more. I mean, I'm starting a brand new career. It's amazing. At 62 years old. But you couldn't do that, which I think will be your most profound, most in service work without all of the other bullshit. One hundred. Percent. Right. And I I mean, despite all the fucked upness of all of it, both of my parents have agreed on one thing. Probably the one thing they've agreed on in the last 52 years, which is the work that I'm doing now, I could not have done had I not gone through exactly. what I went through. Right. Had I not needed to seek recovery in sobriety in trauma i wouldn't be the coach that i am today there's no way there's just no way take away that i want to give you it's like no matter where you are today don't think it's too late to change it never all that, needs to ha- all that all that needs to happen is you have to embrace where you are and question become curious about whether or not this is what's working for you and if it isn't go deeper into that questioning curiosity will save your life Amen. And I always say to people, you know, we're supposed to evolve and not everything that we started in our 20s or 30s or 40s is supposed to go with us into our 50s, 60s, 70s, other than what we learned from it. Right. Right. You have the choice to start to audit. How is this serving me? Right. And has it served and done its job? And what can I do to thank it? Mm hmm been able to take with me from it what it is that I gained, but leave the rest of it. I don't need to take it with me anymore. You have that choice. I said to my husband at 48, I'm going to start a new career and it's going to be going by the time I'm 50. 
So you 62, me 50, most people are thinking about retirement. They're not thinking about starting something new. They're not going back to school in their days <laughs> to think about what they're going to do in the next <laughs> of their life. Like, it's, I was not to... it's kind of not a choice. I was talking to a group of friends recently, all guys, and I was telling about what I'm doing now and da, 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 and this new job and going back to school and all of that at 62. And somebody said to me, aren't you supposed to be taking naps by now? And I'm like, I, I'm supposed to, but that's a label. But I think you and I probably have had a similar experience, which is it is a choice. Don't get me wrong, right? Like we all have voice and choice. You and I are very voice and choice led. Yeah. But when you're getting that shoulder tap and you're getting that whisper of you need to do this, you kind of can't ignore it because if you right. ignore it, it gets louder. When when God, the universe, whatever it is that you believe in says now's the time. Right. When you can surrender to that and say, I don't need to know what it's going to look like, right. but I just need to follow this message, this intuition, this whisper, this gut, look behind you in the wake of all of it and go, yeah, I do. I do need to do this. Yeah. And now, even though it is a choice, it's kind of not, it's your calling. Exactly. Right? But also, and you and I are people that we are now trained to listen to that voice, answer it, and question it. Right. So that's part of the work that we can do with our clients, right? To start to, first of all, identify the voice, trust the voice, question the voice, and then act accordingly. Right. And that's that's what we get in the process of healing. We get an opportunity to empower ourselves. We get to stop giving our power away. Right. Our responsibility, my life, my sobriety, my recovery, my, 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 mine, I do it. So, but we got to get there, right? right? We can't just start there. Otherwise, anyway, we just go on and on, you and I, just on We're going to wrap up this episode because we, we're, going, we're going to go into another one. But listen, guys, like always, if you like it, tag it, save it, subscribe to it. Follow us, get more insight, get curious, and stay tuned for the next episode. Thank you.